Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Neogen Fintechs Limited Q3 FI23 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during this conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Sonia Keswani from Ernst & Young IR Practice. Thank you and over to you Ms. Keswani. Thank you Neera. Good evening everyone. On behalf of Neogen Fintech Limited, I welcome all of you to the company's Q3 FY23 earnings conference call. You would have already received the Q3 FY23 results and investor presentation which is also available in our filings with BSC. To discuss the company's business performance in the quarter gone by, we have with us today Mr. Tashwinder Singh, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director, Mr. Abhishek Thakkar, the Chief Financial Officer, and Ms. Trivenika Avasti, Investor Relations Officer of Neogen Fintech. Before we proceed with the call, a disclaimer, please do note that anything said on this call during the course of the interaction and in our collaterals, which reflects the outlook towards the future, or which should be construed as a certain forward-looking statement, must be viewed in conjunction with the risks the company faces and may not be updated from time to time. More details are provided at the end of the investor presentation and other findings that can be found on our website www.neogin.com. Should you have any queries or need any further information at the end of this call, you can reach out to us at the email addresses mentioned in the company collaterals. With that, I would now like to hand over the call to Mr. Tashwinder Singh. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me start by thanking all of you for joining us this evening. I welcome you to Neogen Fintech's earning calls for Q3 FI23 results. I do hope all of you are doing well. Let me start by giving you a brief of our company. Neogen Fintech operates on a tech-centric platform-based model, wherein we deliver banking as a service to lending capacity in both rural and urban India through a partnership-led strategy. Our partnership-led strategy allows us to tie up with local MSMEs and other enterprise partners that have a large and deeply penetrated distribution infrastructure. The BAS or the Banking as a Service platform is then employed by these partners in their customer-facing touch points that enable these touch points to provide banking, payment, and other financial services to the local customers in their ecosystem. Moreover, our partner-led strategy helps us reach out to a large number of SMEs through every partner we onboard, and that gives us a cost-efficient market access by reducing our customer acquisition cost. We can then incrementally add products for the end customer, all the while providing income augmentation for these partners and retailers. Our revenue model is primarily transaction-led, wherein we earn a fee or commission on every transaction that is routed through our platform. From our customer's perspective, we've been concentrating on three market segments. Number one, the business correspondence, wherein we are offering tech stack to promote financial inclusion. Number two are neo banks or fintechs, typically companies wanting a full stack neo banking platform. And the third are banks, herein we work as a TSP or a technology service provider with banks to launch their digital programs. Q3 FY23 saw us making significant progress on execution. We expanded our footprint, launched new products, and inked new partnerships. Our partner retail footprint grew an exponential 51.4% quarter on quarter from more than 378,000 to over 573,000. The jump was the result of incremental onboarding by our enterprise clients. The GTV or the gross transaction, gross transaction value grew over 20% quarter on quarter as we transacted more than 3,500 crores worth of transactions on our network this quarter. We transacted over 87 lakh transactions this quarter up from 77 lakhs in the previous quarter. You would remember that in September 2022, it was the first month when we crossed rupees 1,000 crores GDP mark. I am pleased to share with you that this year, we went on and crossed the 1,500 crore GDP mark as well in January 23, demonstrating the jail curve for our business. We anticipate that in the coming quarters, as our partnerships mature, the volume of transactions and GDP and revenue, therefore, will grow at par with our expanding retail footprint. The increase in retail footprint and the growing number of enterprise clients will drive growth in transaction volumes and revenues. By leveraging the strength of these relationships, we aim to position ourselves as a key player in the industry and continue to drive success. 
some of the key wins and uh, developments for this quarter we had a large payment bank that's gone live with our imps aeps micro atm and prepaid card solution a large psu bank has gone live on iservus aadhar payment stack to run its aadhar pay program this is important because this was our first break into the psu uh, banking ecosystem we have started developing uh, uh, we have started development of our agency banking solution uh, which happens to be india's first scale at demand cloud native technology with a major private bank to run its bc program and our uh, one of our favorite and large customers common service centers they went live uh, with an incremental product for us which is the aadhar pay solution we reported an increase of 53% in gtv on a yoy basis and revenues ex device sales also grew by 50% on a yoy basis this is in line with the fact that fast growing businesses like ours often experience evolution of product mixes the consolidated revenue stood at 27 crores 2% increase on sequential basis while our revenue looks flattish there is a significant change in the quality of revenues our j curve trajectory is reflective of this pivot as we move away from leaner margin streams like hardware sales to richer margin products like api solutions our agility in responding to device shortages that i have spoken of in my previous call allowed us to move away from a closed loop approach wherein our apis could integrate solely with hardware source in house however with time as our apis evolved they can now integrate with third party hardware thus affording us the opportunity to focus on richer products we believe that as we scale up and gain recognition the contribution from products like the api infrastructure solutions and lending will steadily increase on the lending side we are delighted to inform you that our outstanding loan book crossed 100 crores this quarter which was a significant stepping stone in our lending journey the lending business is pivotal to our growth story and we are creating the right lending models to make sure we are able to appropriately monetize the network that we built i'd also like to give you some guidance on how we intend to build the business from here on as mentioned in our previous call fi23 is a year of build for us and with this financial year coming to an end most of our conceptualized products and services and solutions are now pretty much in their last stage of development going forward we will be focusing on scaling up our existing partnerships and going live on multiple products that we've developed for them we will further focus our efforts into improving activation rates forging new partnerships expanding our footprint and scaling up our lending book as we do that on the back of these levers we expect to see accelerated growth in the remaining two years of our three year plan which will ultimately help us achieve our targets to reiterate our strategy we are targeting to be a 500 crore revenue company increasing our gtv to over uh, 1 lakh crores grow our bc partner agents or touch points to between 1.5 to 2 million and we expect to deliver 10 to 12% ebitda margins by fi25 as an api infrastructure provider with lending capacity we continue to remain excited by the potential of the market and the ecosystem we are operating in with that i will now turn over to abhishek to take us through the financials and other details of q3 fi23 post that we will open this up for questions and we can address all your queries thank you and over to abhishek well uh, thank you tash and good evening everyone i will first run you through operational metrics and then we'll run you through the financial metrics so our operational metrics have continued to perform well in the quarter gone by in rural tech our bc partners grew 30% year on year and stood at 719 in quarter 3 fy23 our partner bc agents or touch points increased to 573000 plus reporting a significant growth of 150.6% year on year and 51.4% quarter on quarter as we added close to 195000 new retailers in quarter 3 fy23 gross transaction value that is gtv including the payout stood at approximately 3534 crores an increase of 52.8% year on year on the urban tech front our partner count increased by 4.5% year on year and stood at 5083 in q3 fy23 our well tech platform continues to perform well and recorded 15.5% year on year growth in the aeon which stood at rupees 2625 crores moving on to the financials for quarter 3 fy23 our consolidated revenue for the quarter was rupees 27 crores down 2.7% year on year and an increase of about 2% quarter on quarter this was primarily due to change in product mix as explained by tash in his commentary adjusted ebitda excluding the esop charge which is non cash in nature for the current quarter was negative rupees 6.2 crores as against a negative of rupees 0.2 crores in quarter 3 of last year as explained in our past calls we are currently in a period of build which is leading to a higher operating expenses 
and the said change. Ease of charge for the current quarter was rupees 97 lakhs versus rupees 102 lakhs in the corresponding quarter last year. The non-gap PBT stood at negative rupees 7.7 crores in quarter three of this year against negative non-gap PBT of rupees 1.5 crores in the corresponding quarter last year. Loan book net of provision stood at rupees 89.4 crores of 88.6 percent year on year, driven by the significant scale up of our MSME partner focus lending book. We continue to remain a zero debt and net cash company. Our cash in hand stood at rupees 90 crores as of quarter three FY23. With that, we can now open the floor for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The first question is from the line of Suraj Kumar, individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for providing the opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask what is the collection efficiency in loan, loan book? So collection efficiency on the loan book is, uh, is almost about uh, 93 or 94%. I think uh, uh, the, the collection efficiency of the current loan book is, is obviously very, very high. Like I explained earlier, right, our loan book is, is uh, driven by uh, focusing on transaction revenues and transaction data. So as against the old school method of uh, lending, I think we are, we are trying to make sure that we are able to use loan as a second product in our proposition. So the efficiency ratios are quite high in terms of collections. Okay, well, what do you think the region uh, ma market is not appreciating new in fintech? So I think, uh, uh, I mean, difficult for me to say why market is not appreciating, but I can tell you that we are in our build phase right now. And I think whenever a company is in the build phase, I think uh, the investors want to see how that build will happen and how the execution of that build will happen. Uh, we are now getting into that stage. I can safely say from this quarter onwards, right, that some of the some of the results of the build that we've done are going to start showing some fruit, which you will see in the results uh, in the in the ensuing quarters from here on. And obviously, we are optimistic that the market will take note of the build that we've done. Uh, if you look at the customers that we've been able to achieve because of our tech build, right, and I've spoken about these customers in the past, whether it's a CSC or an India Post or a Bahrain or or what have you, and some of the very, very large banks in the country, private banks have also become uh, our clients using our technology. Uh, there is always this big uh, issue that there's, uh, there's a path of acquiring a customer and then there is executing, right? These are technology solutions where execution, first you acquire the customer, then you need to execute against their expectation and then the revenue start kicking in. So in the, in the last one year, I think we've achieved and acquired a significant number of customers, right? And we are in the stage of executing. And as we're executing against each customer, you can see the growth in the revenue, right? If you look at the last four quarters, we've had secular growth in terms of our, uh, our, our uh, GTV that we do with these, these clients. And you will see that in the, in the ensuing quarters as well. So at some point in time, as those executions become live and the numbers become more material, I, we are hoping that the market will take note. So when do you think Neogin will post profit for first time, not on adjusted level, but on actual level? So uh, I think uh, if you break up the business, Nugin FinTech on a standalone basis will, will, will probably post profit in this quarter itself. Uh, on a consolidated basis, because we invested 50 crores in, uh, in the beginning of this year on 28th of March, 2022, and we've been doing that build, um, right? I think we will take uh, a few more quarters before that business starts turning around and, and starts breaking even. So I think for the next uh, few quarters, uh, ICER view will still uh, show growth and will show uh, some level of uh, uh, losses because of the build that we've done. But the growth is all in the right direction. Uh, the business is growing in the right direction. The losses are coming down and, and that's how this business will be. So our target for FY25, as I have explained, is we want to be a 10 to 12% EBITDA margin company. I think we are on target for that. We are focusing 
uh, our energies on that. And, and that's really where you will start seeing uh, the next sort of big milestone for us. Thank you. So I'll request you to come back in the question queue for a follow-up question. Ladies and gentlemen, give us a star and one to ask the question. Next question is from the line of Pawan from Compound 26 Capital. Please go ahead. Hey, Tash, can you hear me? Hey, hi, Pawan, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, Very good, thank you. So, uh, great. A uh, couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, could you give me the monthly GTV for November and December? We used to disclose that monthly, but we have done that for this quarter. So uh, what are the GTV for November and December? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, uh, for November, our GDP was, I think, in the 1150 range. In December, we were back at 1200 range. And in January, we were at 1560, right? So these are the way this happened. In November, uh, the only issue we had was with one of our enterprise customers, where there was a breakdown of the system at their end, because of which we lost about seven, eight days of throughput with them, which is why the GDP came down for that. That was a significant client of ours, which actually came back. And uh, it's, it's uh, with that sort of now stabilized everything. We've seen the jump in GDP for January as I've given in the in the numbers, right? So uh, October, November, December were were pretty flattish across the three months. Obviously, October was significantly more than what we did the previous uh, month, which was in September. Uh, and and then really that's how we've uh, we've been out, right? And December again, we came in at 1,200 plus. Any commentary on the market? I mean, generally, the APS segment has experienced a slowdown if you look at your competitive numbers or the industry numbers as well. But you've, you've managed to grow probably because of client addition. But any commentary on like what's going on? Is it the high pace effect uh, that's happened with the market? Absolutely. But one, I think that's a very interesting question you ask, and, and I, I do want to spend a minute explaining that because therein lies the real uh, model differentiation that we have vis-a-vis -vis the market. If you look at the, the so-called market competitors who give data, I don't want to take names, but you know, you know the names we are talking about, right? They are directly working as, uh, you know, trying to bring their own brand into the market, right? So they are a single, to give you an example, I have 720 odd partners. Each of the competitors that you speak of is equivalent to one of my partners, because I am not going around getting the retail directly on my own, right? I am working with enterprise partners who own the retail. An enterprise partner is what you are referring to as a competitor. So he or she is limited by his ability to expand his or her network uh, directly, which means they have to put you know, more salespeople on the ground, they have to go approach retail stores directly, and so on and so forth. In my case, what happens is when I acquire a new enterprise customer, I get a significantly large number of uh, enterprise uh, you know, retail points uh, which come directly, which is why we've been able to show this significant jump in our retail points because as our enterprise customers go live, we get a, a chunk of retail points in one shot, as against going after a retail point one step at a time. So you do get limited in terms of the amount of money you can spend, the number of people on the street you need to build if you're going and building the retail uh, you know, footprint yourself. Using our partner-led approach, we get the benefit. So the way I think about it is most of the people you think of as our competitors, I think of them as potential clients because we are powering their competition. We are the API infrastructure player, and, I, and at the risk of, you know, uh, sounding immodest, I would say that we are the we are the only player in this space who's an API infrastructure player. We are providing the tech stack for people to go live on these products. You don't hear about other brands. We are not in building a brand at the retail level. You don't see a retail level having a band, brand of, uh, you know, ISOQ, but you will have the retail level having the brand of a CSC, a Bafin, etc. All those are being powered by our technology. So if I add another CSC or another bar frame, I suddenly get 550,000, 100,000, 200,000 retail points in one shot. That's why we think that as we've built out the new products, as we've built out the newer technologies, the new service infrastructure, we are now able to load on incremental retail points. And therefore, you will always see us expand materially uh, from where we are, right? This quarter was a classic example where we got in almost 200,000 retail points in one quarter, which we've never done in the past. Understood. Understood. No, thank you for that. Um, okay, so just taking up from that, so in terms of uh, quarter-on-quarter comparison, if I see you had a 20% increase in GDP, 
but the fee and commission income increase only by 7%. So what is the disconnect? So, so I think I think the the uh, fee and commission income, uh, you know, you will see the impact of of uh, that increasing materially because some of at the time of getting into some of the new enterprise customers, right? There is a strategy there wherein you have to price it a little lower uh, to break into these customers, okay. right? But there's typically a entry pricing, and then you are able to then expand your price points as well as the footprints increase. Some of the pricing mechanisms we use are also linked to volume, right? So. Uh, I think you will see the benefit of that uh, quite materially in the coming quarter. In the coming quarter, you will see the increase in both, um, you know, GTV and uh, the commission income increasing pretty much at the same level. Uh, that I would also like to add something over here. So under index, right, right. in, in in terms of uh, NBSP, the fee income part goes to the interest income part. So, but the expense part goes to commission expense part only. So that is the reason, you know, uh, the expenses is, is looking higher, whereas the fee and commission and income is looking lower. So it is uh, income is actually in two parts. The fee income that we are receiving in the NBSC that is going to the interest income line. However, the expense is going to the expenses line only because we do have a model wherein you know we are getting certain uh, commission to our partner. So that is also one of the reasons. Yeah, I think I think what happens, uh, Pavan, is you're looking at the console numbers, right? So in the console numbers, you've also got the interest income. We need to add the interest income into the commission line, and 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 look at it from that standpoint. I mean, the interest income hasn't increased. So I have a question on the interest income also. The interest income hasn't increased much, although we've said that we've also crossed in our loan books by about 100 crores. So what is that disconnect? And secondly, if I add both of them up. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that if I add both of them up, and if we, I, if I try to calculate the kind of what what is the margin wise pro, uh, margins that I make on a product wise basis, like we discussed in the last quarter, it seems that your margins have also kind of come down. So I was trying to uh, correlate both these numbers with an increased set of volumes, because I believe with an increased set of volumes, your margins also should go up, but they've kind of come down. So on the on the lending side, I do want to uh, make a mention that the lending book increased. What happened in this quarter was that RBI came out with their digital lending guidelines, right? So in the month of I think October, those guidelines came back. Uh, and uh, what we were doing prior to that, apart from lending into our own uh, you know retail network, we also had constructs which are FNDG based constructs where we were lending for other fintech players as part of the whole stack solution right. we were giving to uh, you know fintech players. Apart from technology, we were also lending to their networks with you know some level of risk cover coming from them, which you know RBI basically came up with regulation saying you can't do that, and and non-regulated entities cannot issue uh, what do you call uh, uh, credit comforts and credit uh, guarantees, etc. So we stopped that. We were among I think one of the few NBFCs that just took the regulation on board immediately, and we stopped that business completely, and then we went back onto the drawing board. Because for us, the digital lending guidelines created significant opportunities, but we wanted to approach the market in a thoughtful manner. So we had about a month or so where we did not do any origination, right? And, and, and that's what happened. Now, two outcomes came out of that. One outcome was that we evaluated the various lending models that we could follow. And one of the opportunities that we focused on was on supply chain financing, which is relatively lower in terms of the overall yield, but is also lower on the risk. And, and we figured that was one opportunity that was interesting for us. And uh, and number two, we, you know, we continued with our own origination per se. The impact of that was that uh, for a month and a half, right, we did not have any significant loan book growth. So the loan book growth typically happened largely in, you know, the last sort of two weeks of November and the last month of December. So you didn't get the full impact for the quarter for the increase in loan book. So the number looks good from a uh, from a overall loan book point of view, but the revenue impact was not for the full quarter. In fact, the revenue impact for, was even if it takes 45 days, the book was built over 45 days, so the revenue impact would only would have been for about 20 days. But that impact you will see in the coming quarter because the book is what it is, and the entire book will be earning income for us in this quarter. So last quarter was a little bit of a uh, you know uh, confused quarter for for everybody who was in the lending business because new regulations came in. Uh, we were able to adapt to those new regulations and start building again. Uh, and I think we are continuing with that build right now. Um, and, and I think that those benefits will all start accruing to us in, in this quarter. 
Understood, mate. Thank you for that. Um, one last question. Uh, generally, on the business, as you kind of build it out for the next and scale in the next kind of 12 or 18 months, how much kind of cash burn do you think that this business sees incrementally, uh, given that we have about 80 or 80, 90 odd crores on the books? I was wondering if there's enough to kind of do some kind of buyback, uh, just given where the stock price is at. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't think we are, uh, I don't think at the board level we've had any discussions about a buyback, to be honest. Number one. Number two, I think we don't have a significant burn. 15, 20 crores is, is potentially the burn that we could potentially do. That also we are working on trying to see how we sort of arrest that as soon as possible. It's all driven by, uh, you know, ability to sell more and get more customers onboarded and, and you know, integrate it so the volumes go up. Uh, and, and therefore the burn goes down. Right? It's very, very straightforward from our point of view. The investments in terms of the expenses have all been done. We don't anticipate for us to increase our expense base. To some extent, we'll see efficiencies in our expense base for, from here on. Uh, that will come through, so that will come down. Uh, buyback is not something that we've thought through just yet. Um, uh, I take your point, but, but that's not something which is on the table as we speak. And the 50 crores that you lent to the ISERV subsidiary, uh, that is in the form of a loan or an equity investment? So that was in the form of a PREF. Uh, we've invested that money in the form of a PREF, uh, right? So uh, that money has uh, been partly used. Uh, you know, uh, I, I do want to make a mention out here. Uh, we had actually approved an investment of 100 crores for ISERVU, if you go back to a couple of quarters. And yeah. uh, we had decided that we would invest that money in tranches because we wanted to be efficient in the way we build. We put in only 50 crores and we don't think we need to put any more money. We are not putting any more money. The business does not require. We think with the current capital and the current trajectory the business has, that much money was enough. So number one, we've been able to drive some efficiency there in terms of capital utilization, which I think is, is important to know. Uh, and number two, the money was put in like a press, uh, you know, for various reasons. Uh, and uh, right now we are singularly focused on making sure uh, that money gets, uh, you know, appropriately deployed. We've not used up the entire money. By the way, you should know that we still have about 25 crores of that money still available with us. And that's part of the cash balance that Abhi, uh, Abhishek referred to in his uh, opening remarks. Uh, so we've not spent that money, which is why I said, from a cash burn standpoint, we are very, very appropriately funded. There is no need for us to, you know, worry about capital or raise capital or none of that, because we have the capital right now. And we don't even think we need that much money to burn. We'll probably turn around much before we, we, we sort of go through that capital. Understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. Next question is from the line of Yash Modi from Achega Group. Please go ahead. Hey, good evening, Tash. Hey, hi, Yash. Hi. Uh, so congratulations to the team for hitting the 1500 crore GTV mark in January. Uh, I had a few questions with regards to the number of was the rural platform, tech platform. So if I look at the number of BC partners that you have in this quarter, it stands at 700, 18, 19. So that is, if I obviously year on year it's looking at 30% growth, but if I look at it on a QOQ basis, it's just 18, 19 partners that we've added during this quarter. Any particular reason for the slowdown? I know you've mentioned in the slide that the number of partner BC agents went up 151%, but that has probably got more to do with the fact that some of these clients that we already have would have activated some extra clients of uh, extra BC partner uh, BC agents of theirs. Yeah, I think uh, yes, that's a great question. You know what has happened is that um, our uh, our marketing team has obviously been ahead of the execution team, right? So we have so many more execution projects right now that we want to execute against that this quarter we took a, we took a conscious stance that saying let's get the execution focus done and let's start delivering what we promised our customers to deliver. Uh, and therefore this quarter has been more about integrating and getting customers. In. There is a lot more, there is a tremendous number of tenders that we've been participating in and, and we will continue to do that. Uh, and you will see some of those coming in. What happens is with enterprise customers is that it takes a little longer. The cycle time is a little longer. A lot of enterprise customers want to go through the motions of tendering, etc., uh, tech evaluation, formal tendering, uh, you know, uh, pricing discussions, etc., as again some of the smaller partners. And as you know, we've been focusing our energies on enterprise partners, as I had explained in, in maybe one or two quarters ago on how we are trying to build the business. So the enterprise partners 
come in with a significant larger footprint with a significant larger ability to give us uh, more uh, you know uh, for the same sort of cost and and so that's where we are focusing our energies on uh, but there will be the number of partners will be slower than what has been in the past but the retail footprint will expand much faster than what has been in the past so you know it's a, it's a trade off that i think is an interesting trade off for us given that we have so many so many mandates on which we have to deliver against right now and i think that's really what we are focusing on makes sense makes sense so and the second was with regards to this activation rate of 10% that we talk about in rural tech so is it right to assume that uh, 10% activation rate means that out of the 573000 partner bc agents that we have we have right now we have started getting gtvs from 57300 is that the right way of looking at activation rate Yeah, yeah, that that is that's the right way to think about it. The the only reason why the ten percent number is a little bit of a misnomer is because we we you know as purists we have a sim- simple formula for calculating this. In reality, you know most retail partners you onboard take you know a couple of months to start throwing up DTB, couple of months or two three months to start throwing up DTB. So the retail partners we have added in the last quarter, frankly, haven't thrown any DTB yet. So by the calculation is being done on the gross number of customers right reality is you have to assume a 90 day sort of time before the retail partner start throwing up gtv right so 10% looks low in reality the number is more like 15 15% because you should knock off the 200000 new partners that we got this quarter to calculate the activation rate but your your but because we've been calculating it in a certain way we've sort of maintained that uh, you know the the integrity of continuing to manage it the same way uh, but that's how the numbers look so just wanted to understand then how does this number come to like like it's it's like 5 5 lakh 73 for say for for just example sake india post payment bank is probably uh, opening up 20% of its network right now to us so that will be included in that 5 lakh 73000 if say two quarters down the line they are happy with our performance and they open up 40% of the network then that jump takes place right and so and activation rate might go down as you said because gt with the gtvs will take time to come but is this how you calculate this 5 lakh 73000 how does that work like how if they have not started giving any gtv i'm just trying to ascertain how do you uh, uh, how how does neogin actually this thing that they are onboarded like how do you calculate that so, so there is a there is a there is a onboarding process where there is a downloading of the uh, app or there is a you know kyc of the bc that needs to be completed and the bbc downloads the app and id the drive of got created so 573 Uh, retail points have activated our app have got uh, downloaded our app and have got kyc etc completed so they are got ready it. to do business with us got it so right? so and, yeah. uh, got yeah so, so i am just trying to understand it from more from a capacity like for a manufacturing company and let's look at it from a capacity utilization perspective i'm trying to just use the same concept when i'm trying to say that we have this 719 bc partners so at peak capacity assuming i am assuming we add no partners we just try and in, increase the number of bc agents through these partners itself what can this 5 lakh 73000 number look look like if say they open 70% of their network to us is what i'm trying to ascertain yeah. as in what scope we have for growth right now, right now i mean let's look at let's look at a example like a csc right csc has 1.2 yes. million retail outlets Correct. Right. We are the sole provider of some of the technologies we are providing. We are the sole product provider for them. Right. Uh, okay. But they have implemented these products only in less than 10% of their network, and they want Got to it. expand it to the full network. Right. So we are there. As they expand, we will expand. Got it. Yeah. This is exactly. Yeah. This is yeah. going to be. Uh, this is their expansion speed. Right. You look at India Post, and then and then the other point I do want to mention is with the same retail point, you can add multiple products. So GTV will go up. Right. Whereas your activation rate will still be the same. Right, it's the same retail point that was initially doing only a micro ATM, but wants to now offer AEPS, also wants to offer DMT. That will just lead to incremental GDP coming from the same retail point without necessarily increasing their activation rate. So we are focused on that as well, which means you are you are trying to make sure that because for every partner we calculate all the seven one nine partners that we have, I have GDP numbers being calculated month on month on month basis, right? I mean we have to have that level of granularity, and then we have data where we break it up into which state. and which uh, bcs are the ones which are contributing incrementally right so what is rajasthan doing how is haryana doing how is orissa doing etc 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 right so 
the, the data is computed and calculated very, very tightly. And then we have conversations with our partners to try and see how they can expand which networks, which, uh, which states are doing well, which retail partners are doing well, and, and why and how we should bring in new products. So there is method in the madness, uh, right? Uh, but I think the activation rate is important, but more important is the cross-sell rate. Uh, which also we will start publishing at some point in time on how many products we are selling to each partner. Right? Are we a single trick pony for a partner or are we doing five products for a partner? Because that's now becoming important. We started our business with having just two or three products, which was micro ATM, APS, and, uh, and DMP. Today we have more than seven, eight products that we are offering in the market, right? Right from prepaid card solutions to loan aggregation to, uh, to POS solutions, you know, to, uh, to what have you. So, uh, to account opening, etc. So when you've got so many products, I think one of the other things you need to track is the cross-sell ratios on how many products we've been able to bring to every partner. And every partner will not use all the products or every partner with every retail point will not use all the products. But but we need to try and sort of start tracking that. And uh, I mean, we do track it, but we need to start reporting that as well at some point in time. Got it, got it. Uh, secondly, on this loan book that we have, 100 crores, I saw that the, the net net of provisions it is shown as 89 crores so it 10 11 crores fair to assume that the provisions that we hold is for the legacy book that we had uh, no no uh, the yeah, yeah please why don't you answer yeah uh, so no it's not like that so this uh, book is including the fldg that we have received net of fldg so whatever uh, 89 crore basically we have a uh, 7 crores of 7.25 crores of provision and the remaining amount is the amount that we have received through FLDG. So that is how the index prescribes the treatment. And that's why, you know, it is 89 crores. So the provision as of now, ECL provision, as of now, the book is about 7.25 crores. Got it. Got it. And, and it, is it fair to assume that this loan book has, uh, like, primarily been built from the urban tech CA network that we have, or is it also rural tech that we are doing this loan book in? Some amount, some amount. It's a mix. It's, 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 a mix. it's not only one leg. I think loan books have to be always built with distribution in mind, right? We don't want to be overexposed to any one segment. We want to make sure that our loan book is distributed across multiple products, multiple tenors, multiple strategies. And, and that's exactly how we're building. So, so you're right. There is a certain rural tech piece out here. There is a certain, uh, you know, urban tech piece out there. Uh, there is a certain supply chain piece out there. There is a certain FLDG piece out there. So it's a it's a book that we are building. Uh, I think we are building it very thoughtfully to make sure that we are able to manage the risk appropriately. Got it. Got it. Uh, secondly, on this device sale, uh, is it fair to now assume that we will be concentrating on basically uh, our focus on device sales will incrementally go down because last quarter we had written that we had we had actually partnered with some large manufacturers to see how we can solve this problem but now that we've become open architecture is it fair to assume that going forward device sale will naturally go down no so i'll tell you the strategy on the device sale side right so earlier on we've obviously tied up with all the manufacturers all the tie-ups etc have been done uh, but what we are now focusing our energy on is that if we want to get into device sales, let's go after the enterprise customers where, the, where there are material contracts on device sales, right? Selling a 200, uh, a 2000 rupee device on a standalone basis, it makes no sense for us. It takes too much of a bandwidth and it's not making any money. But if, you know, somebody has a contract and there are two customers who floated tenders where they are doing 20, 25 crores worth of devices that they want to buy in their network, Right, um, therein tying in our technology with the device starts making sense. So you will see if, if we win those bids, you will see those devices coming back. But device sales as a standalone product is not something that we are focusing on. At the margin, there'll always be you know uh, 50 lakhs, one crore, two crore of device sales happening, but not material. Just to give you some context, right? Last year, uh, uh, last year, this quarter, we had about 9.7 crores of device sales, and this quarter we've had less than a crore of device sales, right? But the revenue numbers look equal. So you look at the quality of revenues. We've made up for all the device sales that we did not do this quarter by actually getting transaction revenues in. Makes sense. Makes so sense. The, the, growth, the growth is going to happen on transaction revenues, but uh, you know, intermittently you might see some big contracts on device sales that we might get, which are, there, which are largely because they're part of a bigger contract that we're doing with one of our large enterprise customers who want the technology and the devices to be bundled in as we bid for those solutions. So there you will see those devices coming in. Got it. 
again coming to the well tech part of the business somehow the urban platform well tech piece uh, seems to be disappointing because again if i look at the well tech aum qoq it's actually seen a decline even though their presentation showing 16% year on year growth but 29000 has become 20 uh, 2900 has become 2600 so any comments on the well tech aum why why the decline so uh, i think uh, We've obviously not spent too much time on the well tech business, but I do want to maybe give you a little color on what that business today is. Right? What we've done with that business is that business today has two legs that it stands on. The first leg is the customer advisory business, which is the which is actually potentially the only B two C part of our business line. Right? Everything else that we do is B two B. This is the advisory business, which is focused on AUM etc. Uh, right? And and that's one part, and that's the number that you are referring to. But what has turned out in the wealth tech business, which is what I call wealth tech, the the first part I call wealth advisory, the second part I call wealth tech. In the wealth tech business, what we've done is we've now become again an infrastructure player for a lot of wealth players. Some of the large wealth banks in the country today are using our technology for their analytics platform. So client analytics, etc., we have provided them with the engine for them to be able to do that, and for which they pay us a fee and they pay us an AMC and all of that, right? So we morphed that business away from just being an advisor. I mean, there are 400 different platforms that are doing wealth advisory today. So, if one needs to truly differentiate in that space, we we went back on the uh, on the drawing board and we thought about how we need to build the business in the wealth space. And given our uh, you know expertise in building infrastructure and and technology, uh, I think we figured that we should bring that into mainstay into our wealth business as well. So, the wealth advisory continues. We still have about 80, 20 thousand odd clients who are. you know uh, buying which is we are not a broking platform so we don't do trading but customers can buy uh, you know on our app they can buy uh, mutual funds they can buy um, you know deposits they can buy bonds etc uh, and it's a bi diy do it yourself platform more importantly on the revenue side the wealth tech business is looking more interesting where we are able to tie up with pretty much some of the large five or six players in the country in the wealth space uh, you know they are using our platform and and we build that platform we build that platform uh, for uh, for them specifically so uh, i i wouldn't i wouldn't attach too much importance to the aum moving up and down because that business is also morphing into a into a business where the wealth advisory will continue uh, but i wouldn't even give you a i wouldn't hazard a guess on what that number could be it will be in the same ballpark would be move up a little move down a little depending on what that is that's one number two what we were doing in the wealth advisory businesses we also have a part of our aum which is driven by corporate treasury corporate treasury moves up and moves down in large chunks right so uh, some of the some of the exits on corporate treasury which is temporary exits because they find use for the money and as they get the money back this money will come back so you see some swings on that Got number it. Got but it. Got the revenues of that business are not so significant uh, for us to worry about you know what a 300 crore up or down Does to that business as against what we are able to make on wealth tech or on the other side of our business. Got it. Got it. Last question from my side. Uh, since you said that uh, 50 crores of uh, initial initial plan was to invest 100 crores in I serve you, but now that 50 crores is enough. So would that mean? And and you also mentioned in the beginning of your call that you're looking at interesting opportunities in building the loan book. You're looking at inv- invoice financing, supply chain financing. So is it fair to assume that Neogen would be on the lookout for new acquisitions in this space to actually further consolidate their? Uh, the loan book part of the business one and second question in relation to i serve you now that we are not putting in this 50 crores what would our stake end at because earlier my assumption was that since we put in another 50 crores ultimately we'll be owning a major chunk of the com- company now that we're owning 51% and we've put in 50 crores as pref and that 50 crores is not going how how does the shareholding of i serve you work thank you these are the questions so, so right now the shareholding is 51% as you rightly said right and uh, Uh, I think at the right point in time, there will be a strategic conversation with the with the founders of Icer View on on how we can sort of expand uh, that that uh, shareholding further. Um, like I said, uh, as long as our original plan was to make sure that the capital needs of the business are taken care of, so the business can be can be off to the races as far as our business is concerned. I think that part has already been done. As far as the ownership is concerned, there is a separate conversation that needs to happen. Uh, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, as to when that's going to happen, but it's certainly something that's on the cards uh, on our things to do, uh, and I can probably circle back in the next couple of quarters with more clarity on that one. Number two, in terms of acquisition, I think on the lending side, 
we are actually more keen to build it organically rather than do inorganic purely on the lending side. I think inorganically what we want to build or buy are businesses that give us technology or gives us access to a client segment that we otherwise will take too much time to build on our own. That's my thought on acquisitions, right? Either we get new product segments or new technologies that we can, you know, uh, leverage off in our network. We have a pretty significant uh, distribution network. I don't want to take a minute on explaining our distribution network, right? On the Google Tech side, you all heard of, read about the 573 number. To me, the 573 number is a spec because if I just look at the opportunity set which we can deliver out of the 719 partners we have, that number could easily go to one and a half, two million, uh, right? Uh, pretty quickly. That's one. On the, on the urban tech side, we have more than 5,000 chartered accountants that operate with us on our urban tech platform. And, and, and those guys are, each of those CAs are actually dealing with between 150 to 250 MSMEs. Um, right. And, and that is a very interesting part of our footprint as well, which we haven't monetized yet. And that's something that we need to think about on how we monetize that footprint um, as well. Uh, and, and, and when I look at both these coverages that we built or the distribution channels that we built in both urban and rural tech, I think it looks like a pretty interesting outcome for us. Obviously, we need to find the right mechanisms for monetizing both these networks, which is what we are focusing on. Um, and I think in the next uh, couple of quarters, we'll hear a lot about both these segments from us uh, as to what we are doing to monetize them. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best to the team. Thank you, Ash. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask the question. The next question is from the line of Pratik South, individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Tash. Uh, just one question to start off with. Uh, you had mentioned about our own proprietary switch. Right now, how much percentage of the GTV is flowing through the, our switch? And second, what is the difference in the bottom line and the top line impact when it moves to the, our own switch? So, uh... I think we have now built multiple switches. Firstly, there's no single switch, right? We have a micro ATM switch. We've built an AEPS switch. We have a DMT switch. Uh, we have an IMPS switch. Uh, and there are multiple, multiple entities that are using our own switch. Some of our large enterprise customers are still not using our switch because they already have tie-ups with, you know, some of the switch, et cetera. And then we are working with, with some of them uh, to create uh, a, a switch for them, which we are building. Effectively, it will be our switch, which we will manage for them. Uh, it will be owned by them, but it will be completely managed and, and created by us. So once that happens, then you will see a far significant number of volume going through our switch. Uh, I, I don't know the exact number of what is the volume going through our switch, but I don't think it is more than 20, 25 uh, or 30% of our volume that's going through our switches yet. Right? But as we get uh, one of these, one or two of these enterprise customers to completely convert to our switch, suddenly you see a jump. And I'm hoping that jump will happen in Q1 of next year. It won't happen in Q4 of this year, but Q1 of next year, as per our roadmap for building the switches, we've got uh, switches being built for one large enterprise customer. which need to be delivered uh, by the first week of March. Uh, once that goes live, you'll see a significant volume that will start moving into, into our own switch uh, from, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, from, uh, from those enterprise customers. Um, in terms of economics, uh, there, there, are, there are obviously better economics because you don't need to pay the bank, which we currently need to pay when we use a bank switch, right? And the amount may be five, seven basis points. It, it may not be significant from a per transaction basis, but on a cumulative volume basis, it becomes significant number one. But more importantly, it creates a much more uh, control for us on our transactions because our own switch, we are able to manage uh, the customer experience significantly better. Which is one of the reasons we've been able to convince the enterprise customers to use our switch, even though they've been using other bank switches and, and they're happy and they've mandated us to, you know, create the switches basis the way we built our switches, uh, you know, to, to move the volume through that. So that's really the impact that's going to happen. Um, I think still some time to go. Uh, first quarter next year, I think uh, I, will, uh, I will get this data also in these calls to make sure that you have a sense of what is the percentage of the volume that's going through switches, which are developed and managed by us. The line for the participant dropped. Ladies and gentlemen, you may press star and one to ask a question. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to thank everyone for joining us. I, I do want to mention that uh, we think we are turning a corner with this, uh, with the third quarter. Uh, fourth quarter onwards, you should see uh, significant improvements on all metrics. Uh, I do want you to keep, uh, uh, keep looking out uh, on us, uh, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again uh, with you for numbers. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. On behalf of Neogen Fintech Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.